Good, good. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, we're excited to have uh, such a big group this year. Um, so we're excited to kick off uh, our 2017 Kidney Cancer Association sponsored uh, patient uh, uh, survivor conference. Um, this is our third year for doing a conference and with a plan that this would be an annual signature event for our program and our campus. And so uh, look for this late June, early July um, uh, next year as it comes along. Um, so let me start off uh, by introducing myself. I'm Scott Tycote, many of you I know, but um, for folks that, uh, that don't know me, uh, that haven't seen me in clinic, I'm a medical oncologist here at the University of Washington campus, uh, specializing in kidney cancer uh, and melanoma care on our campus, and I'm our site director for um, kidney cancer research. Uh, and so to start off our program today, I want to introduce uh, Carrie Koniski. Uh, we're very excited to have Carrie here. She's the CEO for the Kidney Cancer Association, which is a national advocacy group for kidney cancer. So I'm going to uh, bring Carrie up to uh, kick off the morning. Hi, good morning everyone. It's been so nice to meet all of you um, as you came in today. Um, as Dr. Tycote said, I'm Carrie Konoski. I am the CEO of the Kidney Cancer Association. Um, before I get started, just telling you a little bit more about what we do, I wanted to thank Dr. Tycote again um, for putting this meeting on for us, for his team, and especially Samantha, for all your help with the outreach. I know there's a lot of new faces here this year, which is exciting to see. Um, so just a little bit about the association for those of you that are not familiar with what we do. Um, the Kidney Cancer Association was established in 1990 by a kidney cancer um, patient, Jean Schoenfeld. Um, in 1990, we did not have anything for kidney cancer patients. There was no meetings like this. Um, there really wasn't any kind of internet or technology. So um, when Dr. Schoenfeld was diagnosed, he felt very alone. Um, he was a um, professor at the Medill School of Journalism at Northwestern, so a very intelligent academic um, gentleman who thought, well, there's got to be something I can do about this. So he got a message boards up on the internet before that was really a thing that people knew what to do with. He worked with his doctor, um, Dr. Nick Vogelzang, who was in Chicago at the time and is now still treating patients out um, in Nevada. And they sat around the kitchen table with a couple of their patients and thought, what can we do? And so that was the start of the Kidney Cancer Association. Um, it was really about pushing to get um, some sort of treatment to get research to be done for kidney cancer, um, advocating in D.C., um, you know, trying to find a network of patients uh, throughout throughout the U.S. To, to see, you know, how many people really were affected and what were the needs of patients. And so here we are, 27 years later, um, which is hard to believe, um, with so many therapies now for patients. We've got a meeting with um, 90 people signed up for this meeting this year, and it's only our third year here in Seattle. And this is just one of about six meetings like this that we do throughout the U.S. Um, we work globally now, so instead of being just at a tiny kitchen table um, outside of Chicago, we are now all over the world. Um, I'm coming from Tampa. We um, had been based in Chicago up until about four years ago when we realized we were growing really fast um, and globally, and that being in one time zone in one office um, didn't really make a whole lot of sense anymore. So um, we um, now have um, volunteers and uh, staff members and contractors that we work with all over the world um, with some of the top um, physicians, um, nurses, and um, we we have an amazing board of directors who is very involved. Many of them are patients and survivors or caregivers like yourself. Um, in addition to meetings like this, uh, we do smaller support group meetings um, in local communities. Um, Art and Julie, who some of you know, um, may have spoken to already this morning, they do a meeting about five times a year, yes, um, in the evenings where they will um, vary the topics and they are fantastic about communicating. So if you didn't sign up for their list out there, please do so now and we try to send out through our network as well when they're doing meetings. If you're not local enough for that and are interested in doing something in your area, um, you can contact me or go to the website and email the um, general office information and someone will get back to you to, to help you get something started. We do medical um, symposia as well. So we, from the beginning um, with Dr. Schoenfeld's model is it's always been extremely important to us to not only educate patients and families about what's going on in the disease, but also to make sure that physicians um, stay educated on what's going on in research. So we do a meeting here in the U.S. every fall, and then we go to Europe every spring um, for our global impact. Um, that meeting is for physicians only, but we do put those videos online. So if you have access to the website and haven't been to our um, to the kidneycancer.org website, I would encourage you to, to do so and go 
to the video section and you can see um, more at a medical level, but um, it talks more about kind of what, what's going on in research for, for kidney cancer um, right now. We also fund research. Um, our projects are primarily um, young investigator awards, so knowing we've been around since 1990, we've been extremely fortunate that the doctors who were there from the beginning are still around and still working hard, but they have realized that eventually they are not going to be, be there and not be the ones sitting at the table, and so they want to encourage the younger minds to keep focusing on this disease so that we don't lose all the amazing momentum that we have, have had. So we fund um, two projects um, through larger institutions, and then we do two to three um, grants directly through the Kidney Cancer Association that are peer-reviewed. Um, and then we help to advocate. So if it's some, you talking to us, wanting to know, you know information that you can pass along to insurance companies to help for um, getting therapies approved, um, a lot of that is globally um, our advocacy work because um, a lot of other countries don't have the access to the drugs that we do. So we spend a lot of time trying to work um, on that. And our uh, funding um, comes a lot from the pharmaceutical industry. So I do want to thank Pfizer for helping to support this meeting um, to make it possible for you to all be here um, to put this meeting on video so that patients who are not able to be here with us today are able to watch that. Um, and we rely on donations um, from patients and families. So at any time, if you want to give, if you have friends and family that want to know how they can contribute, you can always make a donation to our organization and let them know what we do, that we provide education and we do research. Um, and then we also do, we have a lot of people now who are interested in doing their own fundraiser. So being a small disease, it's sometimes hard to, to do races and galas all over the world. So we work with a lot of families who, um, in their communities, that want to start a race or want to join a run or um, do an event in their town. And if that's something you're interested in, if you have family members who, again, who want to do something to give back, help raise awareness because you're the first person they've ever heard of that had kidney cancer, we can help you do that. Um, one thing I'm doing this year, they'll be raising funds. I'm a runner, um, and I'll be hitting my 12-year mark at the KCA in August. So my goal this year is to do a race every month, 12 months for 12 years. So um, I'll be doing that and putting that out to, to try to raise some funds this year and, and see what we can do with that. So um, I think that's my brief overview of the KCA. I will be here all day if you guys have any questions or want to talk a little bit more about some of the specific work that we've been doing. There will be a lot of information coming at you today, I'm sure. So again, this will be videotaped and we will send an email out to let you know um, when that's online. So if you have questions. So with that, with that, I will turn it to Dr. Taikoti. Thank you all and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Carrie. Okay, uh, so before I bring up the first speaker, um, I just wanted to make a few comments to just kind of introduce uh, an overview of, of today's program and some of the thoughts going into the different talks uh, that we have lined up for you. Um, so there is a printed program. If you didn't pick one up, right outside on the table, you can grab uh, the program. Um, so the morning session, we'll have four speakers, uh, a short break. Um, there's restroom down the hallway. Um, when you go back towards the uh, front door by the uh, information desk, take a left and you'll find them. Um, and then we'll break for lunch. Before the lunch break, I would ask the morning speakers um, that are still able to stay, if we can come up and just do uh, a speaker panel and field questions. And, you know, we're here for you folks. Um, so as we go through the talks, if you have questions, don't be bashful. Uh, each of the speakers is happy to take on a few questions after each talk, but then we'll have a panel session as well. And if you don't have questions, you're welcome to hit the lunch break a little bit early um, for that. So just, uh, you know, an overview. Kidney cancer, is it rare, is it not rare? Um, what's the burden of disease in the U.S.? I just like to look at American Cancer Society statistics. Um, about 64,000 new kidney cancer diagnoses annually in the U.S., 14,400 deaths. And uh, it's a male predominant disease, about two to one male incidence versus females across um, ethnic groups. Um, so in men, it's the sixth most common cancer in the U.S., about 5% of new cancer diagnoses. For women, uh, 3%. So it's a top 10 cancer. Um, it's fairly prevalent, but, you know, doesn't rise to the level of uh, breast or lung or colon. And if you look at the stage distribution of kidney cancer, so this is a large group of patients, I think gives you a good statistical feel for what's, what do patients look like that get diagnosed with kidney cancer. Um, this is a large uh, database that captures uh, new cancer diagnoses from hospitals nationwide, 1,400 hospitals reporting uh, cancer incidents. 370,000 total cases. And so um, you look at the breakdown, the most common presentation of kidney cancer is a local tumor uh, and a stage one tumor, meaning less than seven centimeter in size. So 
smaller size uh, tumors in the kidney is the most common way that kidney cancer is going to present uh, and be detected. Stage two and stage three are still local tumors, meaning it's a kidney mass. There's no evidence of cancer beyond the kidney, um, but a larger tumor or tumor that's beginning to impinge on uh, associated structures like blood vessels, lymph nodes. And then stage four are patients that have clear-cut metastatic disease at the time of diagnosis. So only a minority of patients fall into that category when they're first detected uh, with kidney cancer. Uh, and the local tumor is by and large a disease that's going to be managed by, by surgical therapy. So the first talk uh, by Dr. Gore, um, uh, a urology surgeon here on campus, associate professor at the University of Washington, is uh, entitled Surveillance for Localized Kidney Cancer. So speaking to the majority of patients that are going to present with a local tumor uh, and what's the current state of the art for uh, managing those patients. And then I'll be speaking after Dr. Gore. And uh, my topic, my title, New Developments in Adjuvant Therapy for Renal Cell Carcinoma. So from the medical oncologist standpoint, when I receive a patient from my urology colleagues that's had nephrectomy, what do we bring to the table? Are there any therapies that are preventative, that are prophylactic? Uh, where do we stand? What's the new data that's emerging? And then what's coming? Uh, what are we going to have as therapy options, as investigational studies uh, coming down the road? Uh, and then we'll have a short break, and we'll come back, and uh, Dr. Fredericks uh, will be presenting a talk on something called the microbiome. So what is the microbiome, and why is that very um, uh, timely and topical in the field? Uh, we think of ourselves as, as a single organism, uh, a single entity. Um, I'm sure we're all aware that we're made up of individual cells, but you probably don't really think about that on a daily basis. Um, but that's not all we are. We are actually a community uh, of organisms, all of us are colonized with, with microbes that are part of our body, part of our normal uh, flora. You can't get rid of them. They're always there. Uh, and a couple little factoids uh, here. There are 10 to 100 trillion individual microbes that are part of our body, our skin surfaces, uh, our mouths, upper air, uh, airway tract, uh, but primarily the gut, the GI tract, and the lower bowel is, of course, not a sterile environment and has a tremendous content of, of microbes as part of its normal biology. Uh, there are tenfold more individual microbes as part of us than the cells that make up our body, and so um, those numbers are fairly staggering. There's about 10,000 different species of microbes on any of us uh, as part of our normal flora, and if you looked at the unique genes in those microbes, there's a hundredfold more genes in the microbes that are part of us than the genes that make up our own body. And so, um, it's an intimate part of, of, of what we are, and it's becoming increasingly clear that the microbial flora that we have can influence uh, health in a variety of ways. And so this idea of, of what's the content of our microbiological community that we live with and how is it affecting health is becoming uh, an area of interest in a lot of different health arenas. But in cancer, uh, in the world now that we live in where immunotherapy drugs are becoming commonplace across cancers of all kinds, but certainly in kidney cancer, how does this uh, part of our biology influence the success of those drugs? Uh, how does it react to cancer therapies applied that might injure your guts, change your flora? Uh, what about intentionally manipulating the process? What about probiotic therapy? What if you get antibiotics? It's becoming a very um, timely issue. Uh, it's talked about widely at cancer meetings. And so um, Dave Fredericks is an expert in this area, has been working on the microbiome for many years, and will give us uh, some insight into how this area is going to impact how we think about um, cancer delivery and cancer therapy. Uh, so Dr. Fredericks may uh, get here at hopefully at break time. Uh, and so we'll talk about cancer in the human microbiome and give you a lot more detail and insight into where this field is going. But I think incredibly timely uh, for the immuno-oncology world that we live in in the last couple of years. And then the next two topics I think link together uh, uh, in a conceptual way. Uh, as we're applying immunotherapy treatments to patients, we know the success is very heterogeneous. For some patients, it works great. For other patients, not so much. And for some patients, it doesn't seem to do anything useful at all. And the question is, can you manipulate the system? How could you make therapies work better? Um, and so on the left panel here is a patient that's receiving an immunotherapy compound and it's doing nothing. And so the, the unresponsive or so-called cold tumors in blue. And the issue that overlaps with a variety of different possible maneuvers is, can you provide some kind of intervention locally 
to only part of the total tumor in a patient that's going to change the immunological appearance of the tumor, make it more immune reactive, and you'll get uh, secondary effects at lesions that you haven't manipulated, you haven't treated, that are immune mediated. So the immune system gets activated, you create some kind of, of autologous vaccine effect by manipulation you apply, uh, and that gives you a therapeutic effect that crosses over and recognizes multiple tumor lesions. Uh, that could be radiation-based therapy. Uh, there's a brand new therapeutic for melanoma that's an injectable uh, uh, virus. It's a modified human herpes virus called TVAC. So injecting a virus, creating inflammation, killing some of the tumor at the site of injection but getting secondary effects at other lesions. You could destroy a lesion with uh, heat or freezing, so ablation technologies, uh, thermal ablation, cryoablation. Any of those modalities overlaps with this broader idea that can you manipulate immune responses, create a, 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 an onboard vaccine effect uh, by treating a single lesion. Uh, when this happens in the setting of radiation, this term, an abscopal response is commonly applied. And so if you're on the internet, you're looking around, and you're seeing references to ab abscopal responses, that's what they're talking about, particularly for radiation therapy. Treat a single lesion, get secondary effects at other parts of the body. So uh, Dr. Zhang, uh, an assistant professor in the Department of Radiology, will be speaking about advances in radiation therapy for kidney cancer. Uh, and then after Dr. Zhang speaks, I would ask the morning speakers uh, if you're available to stay. We'll have a little panel, um, field any questions folks have before the lunch break. And then we'll come back and uh, Dr. George Shade, that's an assistant professor in the Department of Urology, will be giving a talk uh, entitled Histotripsy, a novel ultrasound-based treatment for kidney cancer. Um, so talking about that modality as local therapy, but also possible systemic consequences. And then the last item for the day uh, uh, changes track and, and takes on another topic. Um, as we talked about a moment ago, many patients with kidney cancer have a local uh, tumor that's going to be treated surgically. So a surgical therapy to take out part or all of a kidney. Um, so a lot of patients start with surgical therapy because they have a local tumor. Uh, even in the setting of metastatic disease, this is a figure from a research paper uh, that makes the argument that uh, what's called cytoreductive surgery, taking out the primary tumor in the context of metastatic disease, has a therapeutic benefit. And so this is showing you the survival over time of patients that had metastatic kidney cancer. The patients in red started off their therapy with a surgery on the kidney and took out the primary tumor and then received medical therapy that are fairly contemporary. Treatments like um, sunitinib, which is Sutent, serafinib, which is Nexavar, or Bevacizumab, which is Avastin. Or patients that didn't have surgery and simply moved forward with the same therapies applied for their metastatic disease. And so at time zero, survival is 100%, everybody's living. As you move to the right, if patients uh, progress their disease and die of their cancer, they're no longer living, so the fraction of living patients falls away from 100%. But you want this bar to be close to the top of the frame here. So higher is better, lower is bad. And so the good line is the red line. The patients that got surgery had better survival. The bad line is the black line. Patients that did not have that type of surgery had, had worse uh, cancer survival. So we think there's a therapeutic role for this debulking surgery. And so by and large, almost all of our patients in the kidney cancer clinic have had a kidney surgery. And they're living beyond that with very often a single kidney. And so it does raise the question, what does that mean for my life? What should I be doing about my kidney? What should I know about uh, having abnormal kidney function? So Dr. Kim Musinski will be here after the lunch break. Uh, she's an associate professor in the nephrology division, so a, a kidney uh, specialist. Uh, and her talk is assessing kidney function, how much do you really need, and how to preserve what you have. Uh, and Kim was a speaker we had last year. And of the patients I saw in my clinic after our, our presentation, uh, far and away, Kim's talk was the one people pointed out and were very excited about and very interested to have learned about. And so we were uh, very happy to have Kim come back and revisit this topic again, because I think it was very well received. Uh, so I'm very envious of her, uh, her star uh, attraction from last year. So we have her back again uh, to end our program for our faculty speakers. We'll then turn the program over to, uh, to you all, to the patients. Uh, and led by uh, Julie and our uh, Shimura, our local um, uh, coordinators for the uh, Seattle KCA chapter, um, to present some materials, have some patients uh, uh, speak to us about their experience, some of the treatments they have had, and how that's gone. And then we'll wrap things up at the end of uh, that session.
Okay. So let me uh, move forward and uh, kick off with our first speaker for the morning. Um, so Dr. John Gore is going to start us off uh, with his talk that is Surveillance for Localized Kidney Cancer. <laughs> 